Welcome to Align Spotlight, where you meet your manager. Hey, Beard family. This is AMR's Jason Cooper, and welcome to the fourth episode of Align Spotlight. We had a lot of requests to get a sit down with someone on the value side, so I think you're all going to really enjoy this interview. I had the opportunity to sit down with Fiduciary Management's Chairman, CEO, and CIO, Patrick English, to talk value investing. Pat is a portfolio manager on FMI's large cap fund, which is in the large cap value sieve of Align Strategic, as well as the FMI common stock and international products that are recommended at Baird. Prior to joining FMI, Pat was a research analyst at Dodge & Cox. Pat received a BA degree from Stanford University. In addition, Pat is a member of the CFA Society of Milwaukee. I hope that you will stick around for the after show to hear how Alliance PM, Aaron Benson, thinks about style biases when managing our model portfolio. Enjoy. Okay, so we're recording and, hey Pat, thank you for joining us today. Great, thanks Jason, glad to be here. So maybe you can start by explaining the origins of FMI's value leaning philosophy, what attracted you to the firm and why you've adhered to the value stock of investing throughout your career. Sure, happy to do that. Um, I got my, uh, I cut my teeth at Dodge and Cox in San Francisco uh, in my uh, early 20s. And, uh, you know, just might be helpful just to give you a little background on how I got here. Uh, my wife actually got into med school here. So I came here not actually intending to stay. I was intending to go back to Dodge and Cox in San Francisco. I was one of 17 analysts there. And then uh, I met a couple of guys who had a, a, a small firm here uh, called Fiduciary Management or FMI. And, uh, you know, that we managed about $300 million. And I had come up uh, through the Dodge and Cox training program and through the, you know, through the, the, uh, the deep value program there. And, um, you know, I, I began to ply my trade, if you will, at, uh, at FMI. And at the time, FMI was, you know, I would call it a GARP shop. They had, uh, it was more of a growth, a growth and GARP uh, approach. And obviously I had a, a deep value approach. And so, you know, we kind of uh, worked in a mixed environment, if you will, uh, for a couple of years. And then um, uh, I was fortunate, I was 27 at the time. Uh, you know, the founder, Ted Kellner, uh, gave me basically the, the reins to run the investment operation So as, as a young person. So really now for over 30 years, we've we, we moved the firm towards uh, a deeper value approach. And, and, and I, I'll go into what that means to us uh, in a minute. But uh, so the firm basically evolved into a, a value shop in the, in the uh, late 80s. And, uh, and we've been basically consistent with that through, through the last 30 plus years. So it was, um, it was an interesting beginning. We've grown totally organically through that time frame. So uh, moving from a $300 million shop to uh, you know, a 16, $17 billion uh, AUM firm. That's some, that's some fantastic growth. And you know, there, are, there are many value managers that consider themselves to be high quality value investors, but what, what is it about your team and process that leads you to believe that your strategies will outperform over market cycles? And how does the quality of a business impact the price that you're willing to pay? Sure. You know, I think the, the, the qualities that make you successful, uh, really, a lot has to do with your your mindset and your DNA. I mean, you have to to believe in what you do. And the belief comes from having it uh, be successful over a long period of time. So, um, you know, we go through these cycles uh, where, you know, one strategy will dominate over another strategy. But uh, when, you're, when your philosophy and strategy stand the test of time, uh, it gives you the confidence to continue it. Now, we'll get into it, uh, I'm sure, uh, later in the, in the <coughs> discussion about, you know, today's environment, uh, we do see, you know, kind of an extreme uh, level of behavior, of speculative behavior in the environment. But we take uh, comfort in the fact that uh, all, all markets are cyclical and uh, stocks are really driven by fear and greed, human behavior. And as long as human behavior doesn't change, you know, we're confident that eventually when, you know, when speculation ends in disaster, it really reminds people 
why you need a value approach and why a value approach is important. And, you know, people get, I think, uh, a little bit uh, unnerved when they see stocks going up, 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 and, you know, they're, they might have some uh, value stocks in the portfolio that don't move. And, you know, for us, you know, we don't get the, uh, the FOMO, you know, we don't, we don't get uh, uh, too uh, upset or worried about that, especially in environments like we see today where, you know, the most speculative companies are, are gaining the most ground, the money losers are gaining the most ground. Um, I think I, I saw a number the other day, uh, if you took all the money losers in 2019, uh, multi-year money losers that were over a billion in market cap. There were 396 of them at the start of last year. And that 396, uh, those 396 companies were up 114% last year. So really just uh, a crazy environment. But getting back to, uh, you know, why we believe in what we believe, look, earnings, sales, earnings, and nominal GDP are basically joined at the hip. I mean, you look at the total value of large companies. I mean, they make up a huge part of the economy. And if you look at nominal GDP, it grows at five to 6%. You look at S&P sales and earnings over long periods of time, it basically grows at five to 6%. In fact, the last 10 years, the 10 years that ended uh, last year, even before coronavirus, the S&P had only grown revenue at 2.6% and earnings at four and a half percent. So. You know, the idea that, you know, there's a lot of companies growing at 20% or 15% is, um, you know, it's really an illusion because, you know, it's certainly not true. It's never been true in the aggregate. aggregate. And we always keep that in mind as we think about, um, you know, the investments we make that, you know, high growth for a long period of time is almost impossible to sustain. So maybe you could speak to what it is that you do look for in a company uh, and the quality of that business and, and, and tie together the business and the stock price, what you're willing to pay. You know, um, I mentioned uh, the value approach. You know, some value managers, uh, we call them cigar bud investors, will, you know, they'll look for that last puff of the cigar. It'll be a, a, a really down and out business that may be trading uh, you know, at a depressed at a depressed level, but it's not a very good business. It's not a high quality business. So we're not that tight. And there's and there's so many ways to invest. We're not uh, impugning the the reputations of people who invest in that way. There's a place for all kinds of investing uh, approaches. But our approach is to find the underlying business that's that's really solid, that uh, uh, has what we consider good characteristics. So, you know, it has a durable business franchise. It stood the test of time. It tends to have more recurring revenue than a typical business. Um, the RO, their ROIC or the return on invested capital is, is solid through a cycle, you know, well in excess of the cost of capital. Um, the company can control its own destiny. It has a good balance sheet. And the, and the last thing is it has to, we have to be able to understand the business. I mean, there's so many businesses today that uh, particularly in this market where the business is actually quite complex or are really unknowable. You think of some of the biotechnology areas and some of the tech areas where, you know, it's impossible to, to really ascertain the, the, the uh, characteristics of the business. Um, you know, we really stay away from, from those types of uh, those types of elements. So we, we combine the good business aspects with, uh, you know, a, an attractive valuation. And then we marry that with a, an assessment of management. So, you know, it used to be, you know, Buffett used to say that, you know, a good business will survive any management. Um, and, you, you know, you, you want to buy a good business uh, because eventually, you know, you'll have a poor manager and you want the business to survive the management. But honestly, what we've determined over the last 30 plus years is that, uh, a management can ruin any kind of business. So a poor management doesn't work at any time, uh, whether the business is good or not. So that's important to, to ascertain the, uh, the quality of the management team. And we do different things uh, to try to determine that. If, if you'd like, we could go into some detail there. We can save that for later. Yeah, I mean, that'd be really interesting if you wanted to speak to that. So, you know, when we look at a, at a, at a management team, we, we really try to isolate what they can control versus 
versus uh, things that are out of their control. So, if, you know, if you're lucky enough to be in an area that's red hot, uh, it, you know, you could be a poor management in the short run and it might still work for you, but ultimately you'll, you'll, you'll ruin a good business if you're a bad management. So we look at capital allocation. I think that's a really important element how companies spend the money that they do have, um, and then how they compensate themselves and compensate their team. So if you see compensation systems that are built on uh, you know, growth and EPS, uh, you can get into a lot of trouble. The, the uh, managements will be much more M&A focused. And uh, I think that uh, the data would support this too, that, that M&A is a, um, a pretty destructive endeavor over time. It, it can work on occasion, but if you know, if you look at uh, best numbers that we can come up with, is seven to eight out of ten acquisitions don't earn their cost of capital. So, so we really pay attention to the management's uh, allocation of capital, their M and A approach, how they compensate themselves and their team, and how they uh, operate in the things that are controllable. And and I don't want to get into too much detail, but. But as opposed to just, you know, the wind is in their sails and things are going, going well. And, uh, you know, you can look at a, at a number of, of examples uh, over the years of companies that did great when the winds were in, were in their sails and have really struggled when the wind stopped uh, blowing in their favor. You think of, you know, the Intels and the IBMs and the Cisco's and how much they've struggled. And then if you juxtapose that struggle with a, if I were to put those, charts on a fact set and then you overlaid the M&A activity, it would blow your mind how uh, M&A driven these companies become when the growth starts to slow. And, you know, usually that's a, a bad sign. Great. That's, that's really interesting. And, you know, for, for value managers, I, I guess there's almost some type of contrarian bent to the process, given you're looking for a, a high quality enterprise, but maybe it's a mispriced from the market. So maybe you could speak to how you identify and avoid value traps versus sure. mispricing. Yeah, I mean, you hit it on the head. I mean, if it's a business that's solid, has the characteristics we talked about, uh, is well managed, you can bet it's not cheap. And, you know, so we're always going into situations where there's hair on it. Uh, things have gone wrong. They've zigged, the market zagged. Uh, a lot of times we'll come in where a prior management messes up uh, the situation and we come in with the cleaning crew, new management team to, to clean up an old mess, uh, salvage uh, an underlying good business and let time work its magic. I mean, that's really, if you were to just summarize our approach, that, that, that would probably, probably be the best thing is coming into a, a situation with hair on it. The underlying business is sound, but it's being masked by other factors. We invest with a team that we think can, you know, turn it around, and uh, and then we let time work its magic. So that that's a very common approach for us, a common theme. Um, so uh, the, the, your question is, you know, how do you avoid those value traps? And and I think that's the most difficult thing that any value manager would do is is you know how do we how do we avoid those? And you know, I think the there's a couple of things that you look for. Number one, um, you want to avoid the secular trap. If you're in a business where the secular has changed, yeah, you know, you can, and sometimes you can identify that the secular has changed. You get into a situation and, and, it's, and it becomes secularly challenged. And our opinion is once you're in that situation, there's really, it's very difficult uh, to make money in the stock, even if it gets cheap or super cheap, it just sits there in the public markets. I mean, those kinds of situations are better off being sold into private equity and just harvested for cash. Uh, they don't work very well in the public markets. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we wanna avoid those secularly challenged uh, situations. And the other one touches on what I mentioned earlier. If you're in a business, uh, it becomes a value trap if the management team ends up not being as good as you thought. And as long as the management team is entrenched and you become convinced that they are entrenched and they're not moving, um, you need to move out yourself because it's useless to try to, in most cases, to try to change their, uh, 
you know, change their, uh, the, the management team yourself. I mean, we're not activists. So that's, and again, that's another uh, investment approach that's completely legit legitimate um, going in and trying to change that management team through an activist uh, methodology. We don't do that. So, you know, maybe it, it might be helpful to, to use a, a, an example. Um, so, you know, you, you probably remember a few, and, you know, it seems obvious today, but it wasn't that many years ago that you saw, you know, Eddie Lambert do what he did with Sears, and uh, he was going to harvest the value of that real estate, and Ackman was going to do the same thing with, uh, with um, J.C. Penney's. And, you know, we looked at those stories. You know, they were cheap bricks-and-mortar retailers, and the idea was the real estate was worth more than the stores were, and you could buy the, the company and, and harvest the real estate. Um, but it was interesting because those those ended up being big value traps. And, and we did something that maybe other people did, but uh, I hadn't, uh, I don't know, it, was, it wasn't very widespread. We actually went in and, and looked at every one of these stores and looked at the zip codes and cross-referenced the, the uh, income, you know, the type of uh, neighborhoods that these stores were in. And it became apparent to us that uh, the real estate value was grossly overstated uh, by these, uh, you know, vaunted value managers. And, and uh, you know, even in our town here, uh, Northridge, you know, probably closed, you know, not long after you were born, um, Jason. Uh, and it's still uh, a mess, you know, you know, 30 years later. Uh, actually, it probably closed about 25 years, 20, 25 years ago. But these these stores were in bad neighborhoods and bad malls, and we've seen what's happened since then. But that would be a classic example of a of a value trap, and uh, you know it's a secularly challenged business. Now the other interesting aspect of 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 that is there's a there's a group of stocks that have been actually fairly successful that um, we felt has been a value trap for over a decade, and that's big pharma. So it's interesting because if you look at Big Pharma, you know, 10 years ago, they had a return on capital in ex almost in the mid 30s. And in the last 10 to 12 years, the return on capital of that business of all the big pharma companies has gone from well over 30 percent down to 10 percent. And so on the margin, the business has become highly uneconomic. The length of time to bring a drug to market, the cost to do that has gone and the probability is quite low. So all of those things have worked against the return on capital of that business. And so if you notice, if you pay attention to how these companies have behaved in the last, especially the last five years, they've gone a massive M&A spree, buying these lottery tickets, uh, all these biotechnology lottery tickets, and the returns are obviously extremely low. Now they've con convinced the street to ignore all the amortization, everything that they paid for these uh, businesses um, and somehow that's that's worked pretty well to to, to fool Wall Street uh, into ignoring all the costs to to grow. Um, but over time, you know, that will come out in the wash, and it's not always as straightforward as might seem. That secular challenge, um, and uh, you know, the, the management team, you they'll usually tell you all the right things. They say all the right things, but we've come to uh, the opinion that that nothing beats what they do. So we spend most of our time evaluating actually what they do as opposed to what they say. That's great, thank you for that. And as value managers, I'm sure you're well aware of the fact that we've been in a growth market now for over a decade. And if you could just speak to what you're seeing in the market, why value is faced a silos that can win, what could spark a reversal? Sure, you know, I, I would like to just kind of uh, it's not really a correction, but it's uh, I want to I want to explain something that maybe is lost on people. What we've seen is the last couple of years, you've seen this hum tremendous spike in in the in the growth stock universe, and it's really much of it's driven by the the Fang names. But you've had uh, it's really pulled the long term numbers with it. So you know when you say growth has outperformed value for ten years, that's true, um, but uh, that wasn't true a couple of years ago. So it's really the last couple of years that have driven this, uh, this phenomenon. And it can change quickly. You know, I mean, if you look at the, you know, the, our large cap product, I mean, just going back to 
uh, the end of 18 um, or the end of 17, all of our numbers were ahead of the benchmarks. Uh, uh, and so, you know, it, 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 does, it only takes a, a one, or, one or two decent years to flip all that back. And, uh, you know, one thing we've noticed in the business is the money never anticipates the performance. You know, the money always follows the performance, right? So, so we have a big burst of, of, of AUM post the great financial crisis or going back to the, to the 2000 tech bubble burst. I mean, we gain all a ton of ground in those bad markets and people think we're really smart and they give us this money. And, uh, and then you go into a market that's driven by growth and somehow they think you're stupid. Uh, you know, you've somehow lost your, your way and the money flows the other direction. And it's, it's just cyclical. And, you know, when that cycle turns and people say, gosh, you know, uh, I can't believe I was paying. Uh, well, I'll just give you an example. If somebody presented you uh, a stock that traded at almost 40 times earnings, 28 times EBITDA, and over five times revenue, you'd go, God, I don't want to touch that with a 10 foot pole. And yet buying the S and P 500 today is exactly that because it's a weighted, it's a, it's a uh, market cap weighted index. And if you look at the weighted average values on all of those numbers, those are the numbers. And, you know, we can prove that uh, any day of the week. And yet, you know, people somehow view buying the S and P 500 as a safe investment. And it couldn't be further from the truth when you're at the tail end of these big growth cycles. You know, you're buying a, a uh, extremely expensive asset. And just because it's an S&P 500, you're really only buying the S&P 30 or 40. You know, everything below that is, is, is uh, pretty meaningless right now. And so, um, you know, we're just in that kind of environment today where you know, values out of favor. People don't care about valuation. You see, you see the retail investor coming in today, uh, and you know the 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 Robinhood investor and the the you know the huge option trading that we're seeing and the spec you know the 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 uh, short squeezes and so forth. I mean, those are not things you see at at the bottoms of markets. I mean, those are telltale signs that people have have really turned up the. Uh, the speculative fever to to a extremely high pitch. I mean, we we keep track of market valuations and have for decades, and map it all out. We build you know large spreadsheets with all the companies in the indices, and we measure all those statistics and have for decades. and And then we check ourselves all the time by you know, uh, subscribing to another service called Luthold, which keeps track of about fifty different valuation metrics. And then we map where we are and we're in the 10th decile. I mean, the most expensive valuations we've ever seen. So today's market is, is by most measures, even more expensive than the, than the 2000 peak market. And people assume that it's gonna be different this time, that there's a new way of looking at companies and the companies will, will either grow more rapidly than they have in the past or interest rates will stay low forever and inflation will never be a problem. So all these things fit into the narrative of why uh, value is dead and growth will 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 never uh, uh, be you know be dethroned. And we've just been around a long time. We know that that those things aren't true. That that uh, again, those things that we talked about at the beginning of the call, human uh, greed and human fear are never going to change. And right now we're on the greed side, and that always transitions into fear. And you know we take advantage of that. Well, thanks. And I guess my last question is, you know, what's your favorite value investing book for our audience? Well, you know, it's interesting that, you know, everyone's going to normally people would respond, you know, security analysis or, you know, the Buffett way or or things of that nature. But um, there's a book. I'm not sure this. Is, I assume that people who are interested in value investing have read those books. But maybe an off the grid book uh, is a book that's, uh, it's not even about investing. Uh, it's called On Being Certain. And I'm looking at it, but my eyesight's not good enough. I'll have to go over and get the author. I think the author's name is Burton. But um, it's, it's, he's a physician. And, and basically the book is about how uh, your mind can play tricks on you. 
And I think I remember early in the book, they, they gave an exam to, or they gave a little uh, uh, exercise to freshmen in college and they asked them to answer questions. And then when they were seniors, they gave them the same questions and they answered it. And then they compared the answers and people were certain of the way they had answered the question, you know, four years earlier, but they were not, they weren't right. You know, that people will, uh, people will play tricks on themselves to, to convince themselves that what they're doing is correct. You know, I think psychological term, cognitive dissonance, it's, it's very hard to hold two opposing ideas at the same time. And, and in our world, uh, you see that in spades today. So if you hold the S&P 500, you can't possibly be stupid. You know, Warren Buffett told you to do that. Um, you know, it's got to be a smart idea. And then when I tell you, like I did a minute ago, how expensive that is, and you were taught that value investing is about buying cheaper stocks, cheap stocks, those, those ideas don't fit, right? So you have to create a new narrative in your mind about uh, what I'm doing. You know, most investors, their safe money is in the S&P 500. And we will tell you that's, that's one of the riskiest things you could do in today's market. And they can't put those things together. So what they do is they get rid of the value manager who's telling them that, and they go by the, the index or the growth manager who's winning today's game. And that's the nature of our business. That's, that's why our business is cyclical. And it's why we can win over the long run because we play against those, uh, those mental constructs that people uh, have in their mind that are incorrect. The importance of that discipline that you bring. That's exactly a fantastic way to end it. And, and today we're joined by Aaron Benson, portfolio manager on Align. So thanks for joining us, Aaron. Hey, Jason, my pleasure. It's great to be here. So, so Aaron, Faiz might use FMI differently in a portfolio construction context. How do you view FMI for Align? And what role does it play in the portfolio? Yeah, that's a, a great question. FMI is unique because it kind of straddles the line where it could be used as either a, a core or a value investment in the large cap space. And we allocate to FMI large cap as part of our large value sleeve specifically, where we have three funds for value exposure. So with multiple funds in the sleeve, we're able to catch a wider range of investment styles and we're combining those that complement one another to improve the overall risk reward characteristics. So for example, FMI gives us a really high quality portfolio and its core value style makes it a great complement for deep value where we have another fund that's not quite buying cigar butts as Pat eloquently phrased it, but definitely more contrarian and cyclical stocks. So deep value, what that gives us is more upside and risk for the, the sleeve, whereas FMI's higher quality portfolio helps to balance that out. Then we have a, a third equity income fund as well in the sleeve that gives us very strong and consistent downside protection. So at the end of the day, with the sleeve approach, we expect each of those funds to individually outperform, but the value add comes at different points at times. So that leads to a more consistent performance pattern for the sleeve and the portfolio as a whole. Right. So, so as Pat highlighted, you know, the, the divergence between growth and value uh, became pretty extreme over the last couple of years. So in, in that environment, how has FMI's performance impacted the Align Large Cap Value Sleeve? Well, first of all, we allocate to FMI and Align for very specific reason. And you know, like I mentioned, that's to improve our, our value allocation as a whole. So we have plenty of other funds in a line that gives exposure to growth stocks. So that's not what we want from FMI by any means. And the last thing we'd want to see FMI doing is chasing stocks like Amazon or Tesla just to juice short-term returns. But in knowing that FMI does have a strong value bias, they're, they're naturally going to lag the S&P 500 when growth outperforms by such a, a huge margin and really unprecedented margin is Pat pointed out in the interview, but ironically, that's also when FMI does its best for us in the large value sleeve as we use it. And that seems a bit counterintuitive, perhaps, but with FMI having a quality bias and borderline core value style, 
it, it has outperformed the sleeves benchmark, which is the Russell 1000 value and not the S&P 500 by a wide margin, whereas deep value as an investment style has struggled for some time. But you know now, since the, the market lows in first quarter of last year, um, deep value is really leading the way. So you know you can see there with a the pairing of complementary styles, regardless of style box implications and whether you call FMI core or value, the sleeve as a whole is just stronger having both funds. You highlighted that a lot of clients bench FMI against the S&P. So how do you evaluate a manager's performance when they face style headwinds? Yeah, first of all, I mean, whether somebody uses FMI as a core or value investment, it's really important to always be mindful of their investment style or really any manager's style when evaluating performance. So, you know, what that means is sometimes you need to be patient if a fund is lagging purely due to its investment style. Um, because by sticking to their process, in an FMI's case, that means keeping a value discipline, they're basically doing what you hired them to do. So you know, we're not going to give a manager a free pass due to style headwinds by any means either. But in our analysis, we're always trying to determine just how much of a manager's underperformance or outperformance is attributable to style factors. With FMI, last year we did a deep dive on the performance, reviewing many things, including long-term results against the S&P 500, uh, Russell 1000 value, and also against uh, a style benchmark, which consists of a 50-50 blend of both of those to better approximate their core value portfolio. And, and what we found was that after adjusting for value bias, the team has continued to execute. So I mean, the portfolio may have trailed the S&P 500 recently, but you know, through performance attribution, we can see that most of that was due to their more value-oriented positioning, including an underweight uh, the tech sector where they've had a harder time finding reasonably valued stocks given the run-up that we've seen. And also you know, due to a lack of exposure to a handful of stocks, including the, the FANG stocks, which are a huge portion of the, the S&P 500, Microsoft, which they sold previously in valuations, and you know, Tesla, which, like I said before, I mean, we would never expect or want to see in an FMI's portfolio. So you know, our analysis left us more comfortable with FMI, seeing that their ability to execute remains intact. And really, we're optimistic that they should be able to outperform going forward, even against the S&P 500, should some of those style headwinds reverse or at least dissipate somewhat. So uh, obviously there's a, a lot of different factors at play there and it is a, a complicated topic. We could probably spend another hour you know, speaking to you know, how you can account for style headwinds, but you know, hopefully this illustrates the concept and helps listeners understand how we're using FMI in the aligned portfolios. Yeah, that, that was very helpful. So thanks, Aaron. Uh, really appreciate your insight. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks again. Well, what did you think? It was a real two for this episode. Not only did we get to sit down with Pat to discuss FMI's investment process and an evaluation of the market, but it was also a great opportunity to learn how RPM, Aaron Benson, thinks about portfolio construction and style headwinds. We appreciate all of your feedback as we continue to create premium content. But are there other Align managers that you would like to hear from? What additional content can we produce for you? Reach out to AMR and we'll be sure to respond.